Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Northwestern Oklahoma State University's Video Guest Artist Lecture Series. I'm Professor J.B. Yoshimoto. Uh, today we are joined by visual artist and arts educator Kathy Liu from San Francisco. Kathy, thank you for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, so Kathy, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your background, please, to start off? Um, sure. So I, uh, right, I'm currently based in uh, the Bay Area in San Francisco. Um, I grew up in Miami, Florida, and I did my undergrad work at uh, Tufts University and School of the Museum of Fine Arts. And then after that, I did a residency at uh, Mudflat Pottery Studio, which was really informative. And then from that point, I decided to go to grad school, and I ended up going to the San Francisco Art Institute um, from 2008 to 2010. And uh, since then, I've just been uh, living and working in San Francisco. Great. So what have you been doing since? Uh, what uh, Have you done any residencies? Have you uh, done some workshop? Could you tell us a little bit about your professional experiences? Yes. <laughs> yes, I can. Um, so I my background's mostly in, I study mostly ceramics and sculpture. Um, and so I've been lucky enough to uh, go to a few residencies. Um, one of them, which I met you at Vermont Studio Center in 2000, 2011, I think, right? I think so. Yeah. Um, and then I've also done, um, I did a residency at Mudflat, that was a pottery-based residency, and I uh, did one at Haystack, uh, which was also ceramics, and then, what else have I done? And then here in San Francisco, I was an artist in residence at Root Division, which they provide um, kind of subsidized studios for artists, which was awesome, and I met a lot of people through them, um, and I just was most recently at... Uh, Interlochen Center for the Arts, which is um, located in uh, Interlochen, Michigan, and uh, that was like a sort of a teaching fellowship slash residency, and um, I did ceramics there. Great. All right, so without further ado, let's take a look at your work, and maybe you could tell us about how you got started with the art and uh, how you got into the current series. Okay, cool. All right, technology. So exciting. That's right. <laughs> All right, so I did this. Okay, cool. So that's screen sharing now, right? Yes. Awesome. All right. Ooh. Okay. That's my face again. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. All right. Can you guys see? Yes. Okay, awesome. So I was going to say, too, um, during the, uh, while I'm, I guess, talking about slides and stuff, um, you guys can feel free to ask questions um, as we're going. I guess I can't see you guys, though, but you could just say something. I'll hear you. <laughs> um, okay, so I decided to... Um, so most of my work, uh, sort of, it, over the years, I've come to realize it's been dealing a lot with, like, identity and gender, um, and specific to myself, kind of, Asian American identity and um, art. So, uh, so this first image is from grad school. And uh, it's one of the first pieces I made in grad school. And basically, it's a meat rack with uh, ceramic meats. And uh, the, the drips coming out of them are made out of fabric. And so the idea is that they can inflate and deflate on a timer. Um, so this is one of the first pieces I made in grad school, which was super exciting for me because I had access to like all these different studios and space and all that. So I was just like, I'm going to make a really big, crazy thing. And so um, that's what I did. And uh, mostly in grad school, I focused a lot on sort of larger sculptures and interactive and just sort of trying to see how, um, like, kind of the individual relates to the collective. Um, so this is another example of grad school work, um, and this is called uh, Seesaw. And basically, it's just a larger seesaw. So this, is, this platform is about um, 6 feet by 12 feet. And so the idea is that... Um, different people can, um, you know, get on the seesaw and try to balance the floor. So the idea is that, um, you know, the more participants on the seesaw, kind of the more difficult it is to make it completely level. Um, so just seeing, again, trying to sort of figure out how individuals relate to other people, but in a more um, physical sense so that everyone is sort of affecting each other in a physical way. Um, this is a fabric piece I did also in grad school at SFAI. And um, the idea with this one, this one's called uh, YYY, which is short for yellow, yellow, yellow. Um, and again, just trying to play with identity and the idea of like masked identity 
and how um, these different individual hoods basically come together to form a larger, uh, like a larger collective piece in a way. <laughs> right, so the door back there, the people or participants, they basically enter through that doorway. So when you first come into it, all you really see is uh, this. So you just sort of are surrounded by yellow fabric. And then the idea is that you can kind of sort of search out the hoods and find um, a place to put your own face and then look out through the eye holes. And so that looks like this. Um, so there's two people in it for this one. Um, and then this is another piece I did. And actually, I started the one on the, the image on the left and with just the ceramic eyes. I actually did this before grad school. Um, but And then the image on the right I did... Uh, while I was in grad school. So just again, this piece is called Supervision. So um, so for me, I guess, uh, I was interested in playing with ideas of like, uh, I guess the mask and identity, but then also like the power of vision and the ability to see. And so like, um, for the one on the left, it was just more, I guess more just about racial identity and how um, eyes for East Asians are very much uh, a, marker, a marker of racial identity and stereotypes, um, and so playing with that. And then the one on the left is just more kind of more playful, thinking about the idea of, uh, like, the idea of superheroes and um, the idea to sort of, like, shoot light from your eyes, but at the same time, uh, this ability to do so also blinds the viewer, which also puts them in this weird position of power and vulnerability, which I was really interested in. Um, so anyway, so then uh, for these next few slides, um, these next few slides are kind of more focused on work that I've done after grad school. So um, after grad school, I was very sad because <laughs> I didn't have access to all the same studios. Um, so then I started, I've always, um, I've always sort of drawn in my sketchbooks and I've always drawn out all of my sculpture ideas and things like that. Um, and so kind of had not having access to all the various like, you know, clay studio kilns and like being able to well, not having access to the studios. I sort of decided to focus back on um, just drawing. And so in doing so, I started to look at these different um, images I've always been drawn to, I guess. Um, and so these images are just pulled off uh, the internet. But basically, I, I chose them because they're representative of a genre in uh, traditional Chinese painting um, and Chinese culture. And it's called 100 Boys Playing. So uh, in this genre, and I have a few examples, um, so in this genre, the idea is that uh, uh, people painted these boys playing, and the idea was that um, by showing these boys playing, uh, it's sort of foreshadowing their future success as adults. So you can see the boys are all like, you know, they're just playing, and sometimes they'll have like random tools or objects in their hands, and uh, you know, so those kind of objects and images are supposed to uh, foreshadow their future successes as like. Um, a magistrate or a scholar. So if they're holding a pen, then it's like they're going to be a super successful writer when they grow up. Or if they're holding a knife or a sword, it means they're going to be a very uh, fierce warrior and things like that as an as an adult. Um, so this genre is just uh, the focus is mainly on boys. So I decided to kind of um, that's always interested me. I guess this idea of like uh, gender and gender preference. Um, and this is another example of that same genre, but on a vase. Uh, and then also looking at um, a lot of, kind of looking at more at Chinese art um, or traditional art, I guess, I started to see all these like symbols of fruits and things. And these are always images I had um, sort of grown up seeing and sort of really, I don't know, had a strange relationship with them because they're supposed to sort of represent this like authentic culture um, that I'm ethnically part of. But having, you know, been born and raised in the United States, sort of have this like weird relationship with all these like Chinese art images, I guess. And so I started to just sort of look into them a little bit more closely um, and then make my own versions of them. Um, so these are, this is just one of my early watercolors. I also decided that I was going to start painting, which is kind of funny because I have not that much training in painting. But um, I decided to just start to make some watercolors. And so this is an early one of um, basically two girl or uh, conjoined twins that are eating some peaches and peaches are a common symbol in Chinese art they're supposed to represent just like you know uh, prosperity and longevity and just all things good um, and then the girls I decided to make them conjoined just so that I could sort of 
portray like the idea of like uh, two like kind of being bicultural or having uh, different aspects of the same body. Um, but also fragmenting them so you can see their two legs are cut off and uh, just sort of portraying like different roles and identities and kind of fragmentation of identity as well. Um, so this is another one, another early one. Um, and so I also try to play up uh, kind of, uh, I guess, racial stereotypes or areas of the body that people tend to fetishize. So like really long black hair, um, and like very yellow skin, things like that. Um, and so this is another one. Could you talk about the scale of your paintings? Oh yeah, so these early ones, um, I like to work big. I've just always been more comfortable working larger. I find it really hard to work small. Um, so for me, these I consider s like small, small uh, watercolors, but they're probably about like three feet by four feet ish. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, so this is another example and of them eating the hair, and sort of just like also really interested in the body and like how the body can portray uh, identity or not reflect it. That's a close up. So I'm also just using because I guess I just didn't know I just didn't know what I was doing basically. So I was just playing around, trying to play around. With, like this is mostly done with like like fancy pens, like glitter pens and uh, markers and uh, watercolor, what are they called, watercolor crayons where you can like color like they're crayons but then you add water and it becomes watercolory. Uh, so those are all like new and exciting things for me which I think are probably it's really basic information for most painters. But at the time it was super exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so this is another one with peaches. And they start to add um, uh, little baby girls, kind of to reflect more of that uh, 100 boys playing genre. Um, and this is a close-up. Could you talk about the aesthetic choices of how you decide to stylize the figures? Oh, yeah. So, um, well, I guess part of it was just, uh, I mean, I guess I didn't want to paint it too realistically, mm -hmm. probably because I didn't have the skill on one level, but also just because um, I just felt like some of the images I was painting is very, like some of it can come across very violent and grotesque, and if it's done in a realistic way, then it just, that's all that can really come across, I guess, initially. But the way I stylize, I kind of try to make it very um, uh, kind of sweet looking, I guess. So it's more, so you're kind of drawn into like by the nice, you know, colors and, uh, and like it's somewhat cartoonish. Um, and I think for you know what I'm trying to portray, like kind of more violent imagery. It kind of makes it an easier way for viewers to get into it without just being um, like outright grossed out in a way. Okay. Um, yeah. And so, what does the uh, almost the violent uh, imagery symbolize for you? What's the balance? Because it seems like you're inviting us to come take a close look, and when we when we do, we're introduced to this very almost gory and bloody uh, scenery. Uh, is there is that is that some type of reference to the cultural identity or some type of struggle you have personally, or what what does it mean? Um, for me, it's just sort of like trying to make physical this, uh, I guess maybe emotional or or cultural or mental um, disconnect from the body, like the way identity relates to the body and the physical body, um, and how people read bodies, right? So like. You know, just those, all those like different stereotypes that without, or biases, I guess, rather, um, that people see when they see a person. Um, so, like, for seeing maybe a woman, per perhaps you're not afraid that they're going to like punch you in the face, as if you're to see like a really big man, right? So, just trying to like kind of show those like different fragmentations mm -hmm. of people's personalities that can happen because of all these different biases and the relationship between the body and the self, I guess. Okay. So like for me, like peeling away the skin and showing those sores is kind of like trying to show like uh, or trying to understand more how like the identity relates to the body or the self relating to the body. Great. Well, answer your question. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, here's a close up of peaches. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and this is just another one, but with big leaves. Um, so most of these I basically just reference pretty directly, I guess, um, that genre of 100 Boys Plain, but I just replace all, all the figures and make them my own, trying to sort of subvert that imagery. Mm -hmm. um, these I actually did at Vermont Studio Center. Um, and so I started to also look at, uh, so again, being like really interested in the body um, and how it reflects identity or, or gender or culture. Um, so this image is actually basically depicts, uh, what is it, the double eyelid surgery. So for most East Asians, they don't have that double eyelid line, but um, it's actually a very popular plastic surgery in East Asian countries, probably like number one in most of them. Um, so this is actually just pulled from a website that this is what they use to um, illustrate like what happens, uh, like what, how this process works basically. Um, and it's called Medical Vacation and uh, the reason for that is because uh, to get these surgeries it's actually a lot cheaper to go to Asia and do them. Um, and so the idea is that like you can, you know, go to Thailand and get these surgeries, but also go on, it's also a beautiful location for to go on vacation and relax by the beach while you're recovering from plastic surgery. So they actually it's a whole market called medical vacation, and that's what um, these next few drawings are named after. Um, and so basically, I just I pretty directly copy the illustrations. You know, I just sort of draw them, but I leave out. Um, the, I guess the written text that describes like what's actually happening. Um, so again, playing with ideas of the body and sort of the skin as being this uh, racialized site, I decided to sort of, you know, have fun with it and ha show the girls like, sort of putting on clothing like their skin as clothing, um, and just like having it be more, I guess, in a way, playful. Um, so that's them. Um, and this is another one I did at uh, Vermont Studio Center. And it's, um, I think this is, this is definitely the largest piece I've done at that time. And it's about uh, 14 feet wide by uh, 10 feet tall. And so again, it's just sort of, again, playing with that genre of 100 boys playing, um, but also playing with the size of the girls and having them conjoined and fragmented at the same time. Um, and putting them in a peach garden, which is also a really popular um, genre in Chinese painting. Great. Um, this is a close-up. Uh, so this is after I got back from that residency and um, I just sort of uh, decided to focus more on the interactions between the girls and this idea of play. Um, it's just sort of thinking about ideas of play for girls versus boys, um, both gender, you know, just in gender and culturally, um, and how, uh, you know, girls aren't, the way girls play aren't necessarily the way people think of boys playing, and then sort of uh, taking those ideas and trying to understand the relationship between um, play and how it can also look violent at the same time, um, but also kind of intimate. So like a lot of these um, a lot of these pairings, I guess, are I just sort of looked up wrestling images online of like young boys wrestling, like on the wrestling team, you know. Yeah. And um, I was really interested in how, like, just from looking at those images, if they were taken out of context, they could either be like in an embrace, or like you wouldn't necessarily know that it was wrestling. But it's a very structured form of play. But then, if you were to take it out of that context, it could actually also be very violent. Um, so some of them are, you know, some of them I made up. And then some of them I just pulled from wrestling images. But I really liked how the, uh, like by just looking at a still of it, of the, the motion, you couldn't really tell like where, uh, like where it lay, whether it was like harmless, violent, intimate, like you just couldn't really tell. Uh, so that's one I made up of the girls putting her hands into her, the other one's eyes. Um, yeah, so these are some more watercolors. So this one is called Peach, and it's called Girls Playing. Um, so, so yeah, so Peach also, I'm also really interested on them in a few different levels just because, one, they're a really big symbol in uh, Chinese painting, 
But two, they're also like pretty commonplace. Like you can find them at every grocery store, pretty much. Um, so just sort of like that mundane, like the everydayness of it, and then also just how they can also sort of be representative of like of women, I feel, or girls, like being sweet as a peach, or like looking very sexual. So, um, so yeah, I decided to make that this the main focal point of this of this piece. Great. Right. Uh, this is a close-up. So again, trying to play with those different um, pairings of the girls playing. Um, this is another one. It's part of the same series. Uh, so just sort of playing with like how the little girls, for me it's like the little girls are all different, but they're kind of all the same, and then they're forming. They're like going inside this big head, so how those little individuals kind of create this like larger headless entity. Um, and this is a part of the same three, or those three are basically a triptych, and uh, just playing the girls, again, playing with the head, and then having the eyes pulled out um, with the eyelids still on as being like a, a racialized sight. And a close-up of the eyes. Um, oh, yeah, so uh, I started to miss Clay, because that's was kind of like my main entrance into, I guess, art making. And so... Um, this time I decided to do, uh, this is called China painting on plates, and uh, it's basically just like a low fire process um, so that you can already paint on already kind of finished or glazed plates. So uh, what I would do for this, for these series is just go out like thrift stores and wherever and just buy these um, uh, bone china plates. Um, and in doing so, I guess I was thinking really about like, um, Kind of like the idea, the history of porcelain, and the history of like China, like these fine, this fine china plates, and how um, just sort of that process of porcelain being created in China, and then being coming so popular um, in Europe that they, you know, would call this a call porcelain china, to you know demarcate where it came from, and then uh, also creating their own versions of it. So this is bone china, which is kind of the European or Western um, formulation for porcelain. Um, so yeah, so just as a kid, I also really, I remember I used to find that very confusing, like the country China with like the capital C, and then the like, the China that referred to these like weird, or not weird, but just like old grandma plates with like the flowers. Like I didn't really understand that. Um, so yeah, so I just decided to paint on them, and again, painting the girls plain. Um, so this is the same theme, but then I started to look specifically at chokeholds. So that's two girls with a chokehold. Um, this is also another version of that, and so I have the girls like, what you can see. Oh, one of them's putting their head into another butt, and then the other girl is coming out of the other one's butt. So are these images painted with glaze, and then you fired it, or...? Yeah, so they're painted with glaze, and the process is called China painting. So it's like a, it's kind of... I guess in technique it's maybe similar to oil painting, mm -hmm. although I don't know very much about oil painting, but the idea is that you have an oil and then you have um, a powdered pigment and you mix it together and then you can use that to paint on the ceramic and then you just put it back in the kiln and fire it to like 1600 degrees-ish and, um, and yeah. So it's kind of like a low fire glaze technique that you can glaze onto other pre-fired glaze stuff. And that's typically how these like really ornate flowers are painted, actually. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So this is just a series of um, the photos. A little blown out, I guess. But again, just the girls playing with the peach. Um, and this is a close up of one of the girls holding a peach pit. And them fighting over the peach. Um, oh yeah, ants. So now I'm really. Uh, I haven't really done much work on this, but I started to become very um, interested in ants as well. And in thinking of the girls and the way I paint them, um, they're sort of all individuals, but at the same time, they kind of, um, I don't really see them as individuals. They're supposed to sort of represent like a larger collective. Um, so in thinking about that and ants and how ants are usually seen, you know, you never think of like ants as individuals. You usually just think of them as like this huge collective, and as a huge collective, they're you know, very hardworking, and they could get a lot of things done. Um, and I started to think about that in terms of, like, how uh, Eastern culture is usually 
um, explained as being also very collective and very um, prizing the collective over the individual. Um, and how at times, like in the U.S., like a lot of immigrants are sort of compared to pests, like taking over jobs and spreading out, and never seen as the individual, but as like this collective, like a fear of the collective taking over. Um, and so I started to sort of think more about ants in that way, and started to think of them as um, using them as reference images. This is my ant farm that I bought, um, but they're all dead now. So I don't know. I'll try raising them. Um, oh yeah, so these are four images of ants. I just pulled this image off the internet. But I was also really interested in how like they, you know, can basically go over water or like gaps in the land by uh, so some ants will basically just bite each other and hold on to each other. So actually just using their physical bodies as a way for other ants to crawl on top of. Um, so this is an image of them uh, walking over a gap. So for this process, like in thinking about these ants like that sort of, again, it's not necessarily about the individual but more about the collective and how some of these ants I think actually die in this process, like just by having the weight of all other ants walk on top of them and carrying stuff. Um, and I don't really know much about ant feelings but I imagine like just sort of thinking about that well and how that would actually play for very painful. Um, so I started to sort of use them as references for uh, my girls. And sort of, so this is like maybe a direct uh, reference to that previous image of just the girls crossing over the gap. Um, and this is the close-up. Nice. Um, so this is sort of, again, the girls, but also referencing ants. And this is supposed to be a, kind of like the, the girls are tunneling through the ground and making a little ant hill. Um, and again, walking on water. Um, and this series is called Colony. Um, and then so back again to fruits. Um, sort of like talked about the peach before, but also um, I guess growing up in Miami, it's been um, Miami's usually largely like a Latin population, it's mostly Cubans, Cuban immigrants and exiles, at least the area where I grew up. And, um, so like for our family being like Taiwanese immigrants, we would, uh, like I remember my parents, you know, in order to get like the food that they grew up eating, that they were like used to cooking and kind of wanted to eat, um, we would have to drive out like a little bit further. There was like two Chinese grocery stores like in our, in our area. Um, and so just kind of becoming really fascinated by, or just really interested in this idea of like food and produce and how uh, you know immigrants will travel to different countries and sort of bring those fruits and produce with them. Um, so this is this photo is taken in uh, in Chinatown in San Francisco, and um, I was just also really interested in the way that the fruits are displayed. You know, like it's not like um, it's not like they paid someone to fabricate you know all of the fruit stands. So basically, everything is very like DIY. Like they had. Like you see, there's chains, and the bananas are just hanging off of like wires that are probably cut from wire hangers. You know, all the signs are handwritten, and the fruits are just in cardboard boxes. And on the wall, that's like you know, basically a repurposed fence that they can use to display the fruits. Um, so this is another example. So again, just sort of like this weird chain that's again repurposed. There's like pegboard in the background, and just the wires are obviously handmade. Um, and then again, also looking inside of the stores, and a lot of um, Chinese businesses will have these like little altars where they will display these fruits. Um, and for me, like not uh, this wasn't ever something that my parents did or that I did or I really grew up seeing, except in these Chinese businesses. So I was also really interested in like how you know it's so weird to have this like stack of fruits like on the floor, like tucked away in the corner, and then they're always like stacked in such a way where you're like, oh. Like, why doesn't that just fall over? Like, shouldn't that just fall over? So, just really interested in how they kind of created these, like, very weird sculptures with fruit. Um, so that's another example. So you can see this little altar is, like, just tucked away behind the buckets. Um, and so I started to make my own kind of ceramic fruits, uh, referencing those, uh, those places. And so I just used chain and I used um, sort of similar materials like the wire hangers to make the hooks. 
And then um, these bananas are slip casts, so it's just a ceramic process of making a mold of actual bananas from these places and then recreating them in uh, clay. And then um, glazing them in such a way where I wanted to like kind of expose the flesh again and sort of reveal like this, the I guess the meat underneath in a way. Kind of like anthropomorphizing them. Um, so more bananas, close up. This is another close up. Was this from your show in Portland or? Yeah, yeah, you saw this. Yes. Saw this live. Um, yeah, so this is another, so this one's more referencing the altars. So having these like pedestals with like stacks of fruit on top. Um, and this is the view from above. So um, I basically kind of wanted to just keep it to fruits that I found in these places. So some of them, I guess, like are pretty. Um, Ameri most Americans are used to seeing, you know, like peaches and whatever, cantaloupe and pineapple, but then they have some like weirder fruits like the jackfruit and, or not weirder, I guess, but more, um, I guess, exotic fruits like jackfruit and bitter melon. And again, painting them so that they're like kind of, their flesh is exposed. Um, that's a close up of the oranges. Um, and so the idea for me is like, I really like to kind of, uh, kind of like to portray these fruits like in a way where they're kind of like, you know, they're not well, like they're bleeding. And um, so they're kind of like bruised and rotting in a way, but also like capturing that in ceramics so that's uh, permanent. They're permanently that way, like in that state. Um, peaches and I think that's it. Well, it seems like your fruits, your fruit series seems a lot like your little girls that you uh, uh, painted with the pairings. With the wrestling, I mean, it's almost like this little relationship on each of these little altars for the fruits of themselves. So I feel like the fruits have a uh, personality of their own as well. Yeah, uh, totally. Yeah, especially yeah. with the the, f the flesh color that you painted on on the ceramic, uh, it just gives it that much more organic, uh, creature-like feel as opposed to just the fruit that we consume. Yeah. Um, so was that on purpose? Do you want to give them life in some way, um, or different? Uh, would that we want to recontextualize these fruits in the way that we see them as like uh, living, um, moving organisms of, of sorts, or? Yeah, kind of. I think <laughs> for me, it's like more about the idea of like, uh, like people traveling to different places. Like people who are originally from one place but travel to another place, um, and then trying to like set up roots there. Um, so sort of just like representing okay. that kind of, um, I guess, fragility, <clears throat> fragility in a way that right. people, or experiences that people have. Um, and also as well, like traveling, because are originally from Asia, you know, but now they're like everywhere. And so like the success of certain fruits and produce being able to like be transplanted everywhere versus other kinds of kind of more, more niche, you know? Okay. Great. Uh, thank you for showing us the slides. Uh, if you want to get out of the uh, full screen, let's let, let us see your face again. Um, uh, okay. All right. So, turning our attention to my class, does anybody have any questions for Kathy? I have a question. Go ahead, Matt. I was wondering, um, you have a lot of our peaches. Is that in relationship to the Chinese topian fable? Peach blossom land. The what? There's a Chinese utopian fable called like Peach Blossom Land. So yeah. Here, there's like a dystopian version of that. Yeah, yeah. totally. So yeah, I really love how. I mean, in general, it's not specific. It's not specific, I guess, to that specific story, but just like in general, they're always sort of seen as this like, you know, it's like that's what the mortals eat. Like that is what like basically like all good things, all happiness, like success, money, prosperity. And just that idea that this like fruit can encapsulate like all of that, you know, I think is really funny and just sort of trying to distort that, I guess. Okay, cool. Anybody else? So all your paintings of the girls, they're all kind of about trying to get to prosperity. Is that kind of what you're getting there? Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's necessarily that, but just I just. I guess it's like more commenting on this idea that like, um, you know, like these ideas of prosperity are mostly like geared towards boys, you know, and they just sort of like trying to be like, what about the girls? And now, you know, because of this, like, there's all these like, I mean, I think, you know, Western countries as well, 
there's all these like distortions about what it means to be a boy, what it means to be a girl, and ideas of gender that are very flawed. And I think people have like sort of messed up ideas about that. And so um, they're just trying to show these girls as like, uh, you know, they've sort of been ignored basically for a long time. And just sort of showing them like being crazy and like fucked up, I guess. <laughs> like just like, you know, because of these weird ideas of like what it means to be successful and how ideas of success were, you know, in that genre was like just geared towards uh, boys or that gender. So I guess just showing like what can happen, I guess. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, I guess it's that time. Uh, Kathy, thank you for joining us today. It was a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, so for us at Northwestern Oklahoma State, we're signing up. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, cool. Thank we'll you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.